I'm not a spiritual teacher. I think we should get that out of the way uh, first and foremost. I have been a spiritual teacher, and I am not anymore. The reason for that is because I, Carla and I, have discovered in the 16 years that we have been together that what I honestly believe to be the true essence of what has been practiced as self-inquiry as a spiritual practice and that that the spiritual um, category is really unsuited for the practical value that actual self-inquiry can bring. It's not, well, it's not spiritual. In order to get, in order to be able to speak about this intelligently, we really need to start by talking a little bit about the mind. Uh, because I have a view of the mind and what it is and its value and its problems and so forth that might be a little bit different than most people. <coughs> So just so that we are on the same page as to what it is that I am trying to say, I want to give you a little short introduction to my view of the mind. To my view, the mind, the human mind, is probably the most magnificent thing that has happened in this planet ever, as far as, uh, just ever. The human mind is truly magnificent. It is, there, there's no reason why it should even be. I was reading something the other day in which people were trying to determine why it is that of all the apes, we are the only ape that has a mind as complex and complicated as ours. It's not to say that other apes or other creatures don't have minds, but there's no creature, apparently, that we can know of who have a mind that is as complicated and as complex as the human mind. And of course, it is in the mind that we experience our life. That's the first thing to see about my view of the mind. Our entire experience of life is in our mind. There is nothing that we directly experience whatsoever. We we, there are the stimuli that come in through the senses and are mo moderated in some way by the brain and then seen in the mind as an artifact, as something that has appeared within the mind. <clears throat> the mind's a mechanism. It doesn't have intelligence, it doesn't have life, it doesn't have desires and aversions. It is simply a mechanism that, that provides us with a way of understanding what's happening in our life in this moment. All of our sensations, all of the thoughts about sensation, all of our desires, all of our aversions, the very experience of our body itself is present to us only in the mind. Only there. There is no direct connection whatsoever with the body, except through the mind. That's where we experience it. And the mind also is where we experience the misery that is, seems to be the common lot of the human creature. The desires, the aversions, the, the confusions, the, the hatred, the love, the, all of those things that arise within our minds telling us what we need or what we don't need, what we have to get rid of and what we don't have to get rid of, um, are all aspects of the mind. And they are mechanical. This is the hard thing to see. Everything that occurs within the mind occurs mechanically. There is no agency to it. In some way, the the information that the brain moderates is, is uh, projected as the mind into this great world. 
world that we have, this wonderful world. As we look around and I see all you guys, how all I'm seeing is my mind re re creating some concept that I understand to be you guys. You and you and you. Not that you're not here, but the only way I experience you is in my mind, just as the only way you experience me is in your minds. So, it's our minds also, these minds which are, in my view, consists of a multitude of ever-changing, moving algorithms, psychological algorithms that are responding to incoming um, experience and sensation. Most of us, for most of us, certainly for me, and certainly for most everybody that I have ever known, I don't think I've ever known anybody for whom this is not true, most of us are not happy with our lives. Most of us think that there's something that we need that we don't have. Most of us think that there are things that are causing us grief that we should get rid of. Most of us think that um, all of that. There's something we want that we don't have. There's something we have that plagues us and makes us unhappy. That's pretty much our day-to-day -day existence. I want this, I don't want that, I don't care about that. We have basically three algorithms there. I want this, I don't want this, I don't care whether I have this or not. And for most of us, really, the day-to-day -day life, I speak for myself and I have spoken to enough people to be able to say that I believe this is true for most everybody. For most of us, our everyday life is, a, is a unsatisfactory. I mean, our situation might be satisfactory. We might have enough food to eat, and enough and a place to live, and even people who care for us and that we care for. But despite everything, if I have $50 billion and everything I ever wanted and, and loved by everybody in the world, I know for a fact that in the past I would have wanted something else. That wouldn't do it. Nothing that I ever had did it. Nothing that I ever did did it. There are always something missing or something here that should be gone. And that's the way our lives go for, all, for pretty much the entire species. There may be, you know, instances of some people who have lucked out and won the lottery of, uh, of mental peace and satisfaction. God help them, but most of us, that's not the case. You look at the world today, really. This is, uh, the, the world today is like, I'm 73 years old, and I have never seen anything like what's happening in the world today, although I am somewhat of a student of history, and I know that this has been the case before. A hundred years ago, we had very close to the same situation we have now, and we ended up with killing 20 million people in Europe alone. Cool. The carnage could be even worse now. And every, every person who is participating in the kind of uh, hateful ideas and hateful actions do so because they think that they must do that in order to get satisfaction in their own life. Everyone, the good guys, the bad guys, the, the in-between guys, everyone thinking that what they're doing is what they must do in order to get satisfaction in their own lives. That's just the case. 
Why would this be? Why would it be the case that a creature with a brain as complex and complicated and capable of, of being our servant in a way that other creatures don't have servants, how can it be that this creature, this human being, should turn out to be murderous, deceitful, avaricious, greedy, uh, untruthful? How can that be? Others, you know, like we're, we can talk about the, the way the world is, and the world certainly is on the verge of a, another bloodbath, maybe one that we're not going to recover from. But what about the fact that suicide is among the top three causes of death for every death under the age of 45, and is in the top ten for every death? How can that be? How can it be that there should be, we should kill ourselves, literally kill ourselves, in order to escape from the dissatisfaction that between what we think we want and what we have? That's crazy. Crazy. Now, we have one of the the um, uh, solutions that we have fallen in love with, really, over the ages, is the solution that says that there is a greater power, that if we can somehow tap into that greater power, whether through advanced Advaita Vedanta spiritual uh, practice or religious practice or uh, any other kind of practice, <clears throat> the, the, despite the fact that all of the calling on for a higher power, all of the effort that we have made to try to make ourselves spiritual beings, try to, to decline to be involved in the misery of human life, try to shut down our minds. Really, you know, some of the more advanced spiritual practices are entirely devoted to the shutting down of our minds. The mind is the problem. But that's to be expected, because the mind is everything. There's nothing here but a bunch of minds. So. The idea that the mind is the problem is easy to understand when it is within the mind that I am so tormented and tortured and, and uh, unhappy. I want to get rid of that. I want to numb that down. I want to, there must be something better for me. There must be something higher, something clean, something clear, something that has no dispute to it, no conflict to it, no controversy to it. Well, that, of course, is no mind, no experience, no sensation, no anything. And the fact is that we have not so many of us, and, you know, like when you consider there's seven billion of us, but enough of us that actually sought after precisely that state, the state where there is no thought, the state where there is no experience, the state where peace reigns, peace, peace, nothing happening, peace. And of course that's appealing. I mean, I spent a good, a, a good many years and a good long time seeking after that very thing, the end of thought, the end of any um, seeking to understand anything, the end of seeking after anything. The, I am so familiar with that. I had it. 
It didn't work for me. But we have, in the course of this, especially within the spiritual realm, we have accomplished quite a bit, especially in the non-dual Advaita uh, tradition. But even more particularly, in the tradition that has led to self-inquiry, has led to the, 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 the purpose of seeing our true self and seeing our true self to be unafflicted, unaffected by anything and to rest there to go there, to stay there, unafflicted, uncomplicated, simple, nothing happening. The most effective uh, means for doing so is self-inquiry. Atmavikara, pichara, in the, in the tradition. It's the easiest way to get there. It's closest to the truth. But I tell you from my heart that there is an invisible plastic shield that has crippled the, pur the purpose of self-inquiry. And that invisible plastic shield is that in all cases, and the case that I am most familiar with and I am always willing to talk about, I didn't really plan to talk about this but I see that everybody here is spiritual, so I don't want to do it like this. Ramana Maharshi is my hero. He is still my hero. No matter the fact that he, he uh, kind of allowed himself to be handcuffed by his disciples. Ramana Maharshi, I'm going to tell you the story of Ramana Maharshi because it's really critically important in any spiritual gathering that I speak to, to talk about this. Ramana Maharshi, when he was 16 years old, his father died. Actually, I think he was a little younger when his father died. His father died at the age of 43, and in, another, in a town away, away from where Ramana lived. Venkata Ramana was his name. Not the father. Ramana was his name. He actually was, he was well educated. He went to the American school for his high school. He, so he spoke English. He was uh, not, uh, he was, he, he was brilliant. But his father died suddenly, without warning, at the age of 43, away from him. And this, as you can imagine, this aided him. I mean, imagine yourself, you're, say you're 14 years old, I think he was 14 when his father died. You're 14 years old, your father's away working, and suddenly you hear that he's dead. You never see him again. That's the end of it. <coughs> and it ate at him. And he wanted to know. He, you know, he had some spiritual uh, training, not a lot. He wasn't a very spiritual person at the time. But he had some understanding of some of the things about spirituality, but not much. And in, the, in, in his, his misery about the death of his father and the fear of death that that absolutely would have brought to him, in his misery in doing that, he decided to do something different. Not a spiritual thing. It was a spiritual for him. He just decided that he was going to lay down and find out what happens when you die. So that's what he did. He lay down on the ground and he pretended to die. There's no way to say it any differently. He pretended to die. He tried to, he talked about the, his breath stopping and the bodily function stopping and, and he even imagined himself being taken to the burning god to be cremated as his father had been. And something happened to him. And what he described to be that something that happened to him 
was that he saw that no matter what else died, what remained was the force of personality. It's important to hear that. The force of personality. Not God, not emptiness, not self-realization. The force of personality. That's what he said. He stole some money from his brother and got on a train and went down to Tiruvannamalai and to the temples there because he was determined to find out what had happened to him in that effort to pretend that he was dead and where he discovered that all that remained was the parts of personality. He was naturally, he was, he was an intelligent and really brilliant person and he wanted to find out what happened to him and the way he chose to find out was to go to the temple at Tiruvannamalai and have people bring him books on spiritual practice and spiritual understanding. So, in the, and he was there for several years, reading these books, trying to understand. Assuming, you know, as would be the case for any of us in his position, assuming that what he was reading there was sacred text and therefore it was the revealed truth of things. It never did really take with him, I don't think. He never really got all that uh, uh, religious in his practice. After a while there, he, he uh, left the temple of Tiruvannamalai and started uh, going up into the caves and the hills trying to hide from people because people began to hear about him and they wanted him to teach them and he didn't want to teach them anything. He just wanted to be left alone. So he hid in the caves and he would have to go from one cave to another to another. And then finally the, he settled in a, uh, in a cave, I forget the name of it, that, that later was on the spot that later became the ashram that uh, he lived in for the rest of his life. <clears throat> uh, there are there are three spiritual people in the past that I honor really there's the Buddha there's Ramana and there's Jesus those are the three spiritual beings that I think came the closest to reality. And all of them were within a religious context when that occurred. Now, the mind, the mind that we were speaking of earlier, the mind is there for, uh, in order to serve you. It arises in order to serve you, in order to give you the experience of your life, the experience of what's happening, the activities that are going on in your brain and whatnot, the, the sensations in your body and so forth. And uh, the mind resists, the mind resists, although it is, has no agency, its nature is to resist change. Its nature is to resist. We want everything to be steady here. So that the, anything that happens that's out of the ordinary, the mind goes into a hissy fit about it. And when we are in desperate and dire situations, the mind really goes crazy and really um, treats us badly. But even when we're in good situations, even the most, the richest, the most loved, the most honored, the most wonderful person on earth, I guarantee you that person has something wrong that they wanted to have it over with. Maybe they have too much money. Maybe they don't like the fact that people are hitting on them for money. Maybe they wish they were, could fly. There's, but no matter how, rich they are, I guarantee you that there's something missing in their life. There's something missing in their mind. 
life, mind, same thing. Something missing. For all of us, there's something missing. That's why we become spiritual. That's why we, we seek money. That's why we seek love. That's why we seek sex. That's why we get AK-47s and, and go and uh, kill on, uh, honest and ordinary people. Because there's something wrong that we have to do something about. Our mind tells us that. And it's for almost all of us. We have come to the conclusion, Carl and I, and now actually quite a few thousand other people, we have come to the conclusion that the whole problem that afflicts us as human beings is um, a kind of disease, a kind of autoimmune disease, which we call the fear of life. We are convinced that not every single human being but the vast majority of us seven billion folks that are inhabiting this planet now, the vast majority of us are at birth or soon, af soon enough after birth, we are afflicted with an, the idea that there's something wrong here. Now, in the old time ways of giving birth, we, in this country anyway, we could see where such a thing could happen at birth. You know, they treated us really bad. They know, you know, it's not like uh, an easy entrance into the, you know, there are some places and some strategies that are helping to change that now, but not everywhere. And in most cases, human beings are born, at least in this country, born in a situation in which there's noise, light, movement, pain, pressure, It's not a pleasant experience. But whether at birth or soon after birth, it seems really clear to me that we all have been afflicted with this idea that there's something wrong here. Now, where does that come from? I mean, it's fed and it's, it is defined and it is, it is energized by its own self in the form of all of the things that we do to try to say, this is what you need. No, no, this is what you need. Set, give me some money and I'll give you what you need. Or me saying that. Oh, I can give you what you need. Give me some money. I'll give you what you need. The reason that we are so gullible and so suckered by so many things that come down the path, sex, drugs, rock and roll, uh, alcohol, violence, uh, peace, uh, religion, not that there's anything wrong with religion, but, you know, religion, marriage, divorce, so many things that we're trying to find, trying, trying to, to understand to be what we have to do in order to get rid of this idea that there's something wrong here. There's something I still don't have. There's something I still don't know. There's something I need and still can't get. That's because it's the mind. The mind born in fear. The mind born in fear. No matter whether it's at birth or a couple of years later or whatever, the mind born in fear. The mind conditioned by fear. Now this mind as I said, it's just a mechanical device. It's a bunch of algorithms that are formed for most of us within a context of fearfulness and anxiety. <clears throat> Those algorithms are formed in that context of fearfulness and anxiety. Those ideas about what's good and what's bad. Those ideas about what I want and what I don't want. The, all of those ideas are born and they continue to be born throughout our life as our understanding of things becomes more sophisticated, those algorithms are born in an ocean of fear, an ocean of something's wrong here. And that's the misery. There's nothing else to it. 
It's, it's the blind algorithms of the mind trying to fix what doesn't need to be fixed. It's those blind algorithms of the mind trying to help us get what we need to get in order to be satisfied with being alive as a human being. That's all there is to it. There's nothing else happening except that thought form. And no matter how good we might get at ameliorating that, at getting some relief from that, no matter how good we might get, the, the, the show still keeps going on. We get something, oh yeah, oh, that, that's what I want. And then, no, it's not, that's not it. No, that's not it. Everything we try to do is done within that context where the algorithms of the mind tell us what we should be doing and what we should not be doing. Oh yes, this is good, this is what you want. Well, wait a minute, no, actually maybe this is what you want. All working to try to protect us. All formed within a context. And it's the context that's the problem. Those thought forms, they, they can't help themselves, the poor little things, they don't know what they're doing. They're desperately trying to do something to be helpful. Of course, they don't have any agency or any ideas of what they're doing, but nevertheless. But the context is everything. And the context is a silent assumption that there's something wrong. You have to be really careful. There's something wrong. You're not going to get what you want. <coughs> and that's the context. It's silent. You don't see it. You don't feel it. You don't taste it. All you see and feel and taste are its results, which are these thought forms that should be our servant, try to be our servant, try to protect us from the horror of being alive as a human being. And we end up killing ourselves. For others. That context is the fear of life. It's not something we experience. It's just the context in which our minds grow and have their being. Now, as it happens, and this is, this is in, in the three uh, gentlemen that I spoke of, as being those who probably, I mean, I'm not saying nobody else has, but those are the three. I know I only have so much time and so much intellectual energies, but those are the three that, that uh, and in the case of all three of those, I am persuaded that what happened was that they found a way to change the context in which the mind is formed to destroy the old context and have a new context that's clear of all of that arise. Some of them did it. I, although the Buddha didn't speak of it in those terms, he himself sat down <coughs> beside the Bodhi tree and determined to he find out for himself what was going on here. Ramana clearly was uh, when he laid down on that bed or on the floor where he laid, he was looking inside trying to find some way to understand and do something about what was happening to him. And he, like the Buddha, did so without um, without having to carry the burden of a lot of old ideas of what we should do. There were new ideas to them. Self-inquiry was old when Ramana got to it, but he wasn't getting to self-inquiry when he lay down on that floor. He called it self-inquiry later from his reading with the books in the temple. He didn't really want to talk to us either. He really tried to get away from us. 
which is something we've also seen in our own experience, there, it's not uncommon when people get free of this misery that they would just as soon kind of just go live their lives, <laughs> you know, <laughs> just leave me alone. And as for Jesus, it's the incredible radical nature of what he was trying to tell people when I see that, I see very clearly that he is speaking from a mind that is free of the fear. And that speaking from a mind that is free of the fear in the context in which he found himself was not a, not a very smart thing to do, as it turned out. Everything he did went against the grain. Because it was different. Not because he was divine, any more than you or I are. Because he was different. Because he saw something different. Like Ramana saw something different. Like the Buddha saw something different. And many others, too. But as I say, I only have so much time and so much intellect. So, I, myself, I first became aware of the non-dual realm of teaching in prison in 1994. I had been in prison for quite a while and I had a few more years to go before I got out. But because I was in prison, I had the freedom to actually get very serious about pursuing a spiritual solution to what was obviously my miserable life. And I worked hard at it. I Actually, I started out um, with the Buddhists and, uh, and then moved on. I, I attained a state that lasted for about a year as a result of the traditional self-inquiry. I attained a state that lasted for about a year in which Nothing, ha nothing happened. Nothing was happening. Nothing. Nothing was happening. Everything was at peace, at rest. Everything at rest. That lasted for about a year. Circumstances intervened and, uh, and uh, I went back to being miserable. Decided I'd rather be miserable. <laughs> <laughs> I got, uh, I got, and I stayed miserable for a while. And then one day I was, uh, I think I might have been in a hole. And uh, I think I was in a hole. And one day I decided that I had, I have got to get rid of this because I was clinging, I clung to the idea that somehow or other, it was my fault, right? It was my fault. It couldn't be the fault of the teaching. It couldn't be the fault of self-inquiry. It had to be my fault. So, but then again, you know, I didn't feel like it was my fault. I would have thought that I should feel that, but I didn't. And I decided that what I really needed to do was to rid myself of the idea that there was anything whatsoever that could be done to bring me satisfaction and peace of mind. Peace of mind. And I decided that the thing that would be the most useful in that purpose would be for me to really understand what Ramana was telling us to do and do it. Actually do it. And then by doing it, of course, it would prove to me that that was all garbage and I could go on and go on and live my life and you know go rob banks or whatever else I might want to do. So while in the hole, I settled down and I Ramana would say, Ramana would say, it's the heart. You have to go to the heart. 
You have to go to the heart. So I would, and I knew he didn't talk, wasn't talking about the cardiac part. So I would lay on my bed, and I would go, and I would take, use every ounce of energy I had trying to bring the beam of my attention to what Ramana wanted me to look at. What was the purpose of self-inquiry? All along doing it, because I thought it would free me from any belief in this stuff, because of course it wasn't going to work. And then one day, I thought it probably wasn't going to like me telling this story, but I'm going to tell it again anyway. Why? <laughs> one day, in the shower, because everywhere I went, all the time I was doing this, I was looking, 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 trying to get a taste of my heart, myself, my true self. I was in the shower, and I remembered a movie that I, that I saw when I was about eight, I guess, eight or nine. It was uh, Winchester 73. It was a Jimmy Stewart movie, and some people probably remember it. It was a good movie. And I went to a matinee, and I came out. This is in New Jersey in the summertime, and anybody been back east in the summertime will know it's not a pleasant thing. I walked out of the theater into this horrible heat and burning sun, and, uh, and when I was in the shower that time, somehow or other, that experience came back to me. The experience of me coming out of that movie theater, coming into the hot sun, and it came back to me in a way where I had a, a real true taste of what it felt like to be me in that spot. And it was absolutely clear that what it felt like to be me then is exactly what it feels like to be me now. Just that. I didn't think anything of it. I went on about my business. But things changed. Not supernaturally, but things changed. It wasn't very long before I found myself kind of at peace. You know, not just detached from the world, but kind of at peace with my life. Kind of this is okay. I, it took me a long time to, to uh, fully put all this together. But the, and then the, the time when it really hit me was, and I've told this story, and they're just going to have to hear it because you guys haven't heard it. The day came when I was to be released from prison. And the, you can look me up and you'll see that they really didn't want me to go out of they didn't want to, didn't want me to leave prison. The person at the prison who was responsible for receiving a discharge came in at six o'clock that morning. I had a, a jacket. We call it a jacket. It means our all of our history, right? And I had a jacket about this thick. And he went through every piece of paper in there, looking for some way. He could not believe that they were going to let me go. Mm -hmm. And he's looking for some way to make me stay. And I'm in a holding cell. And I'm sitting in the holding cell. And you know what? <laughs> I really didn't. I really, I would be happy to go home or go out. But I'd be just as happy if I didn't. I realized that I had no, there was no anxiety. There was no, like, oh my God, am I going to get out? Are you going to, nothing, just calm. This total calm. And of course they let me go and the rest is history. <laughs> and I st I'm still out. But it was that moment in that holding cell that I realized that something had happened to me out of the ordinary. And out of the ordinary also in any spiritual context. That something had happened to me that gave me back my life. Really. I didn't know all that at the time. It has, in fact, taken me the last 16 years, Carl and I together, to 
really understand what had happened and really see the confirmation of what had happened and all the thousands of people that now have followed my advice to look at themselves. I call it looking at yourself because it's not self-inquiry. There's no inquiry to it. It's no more inquiry than when I look at you, I'm not inquiring, I'm seeing you. That's all, just seeing you. And it's the same with the looking. It obviously came to me through a path that began, well, actually began, God knows when it began, but at some point it began with the the, uh, spiritual um, adventure. Me becoming a Buddhist started back then. And here's what happens when you do that. Because I'm going to ask you to do that in a minute here. Here's what happens when you do that. And we have, I just want to say as an aside, that that all, it took me a very long time to be fully convinced that what I'm speaking about is really true. took me a long time even to find a way to speak about it in a way that seems, seems true to me and not, uh, you know, not true. <clears throat> and now we have confirmation and, you know, like we, Carl and I have been doing this for 16 years. We um, went through a lot of changes in those 16 years. And, uh, uh, and, and as I said, we have thousands of people now who have done this. And what happens is not anything special. It's, sometimes you can get a slight kind of sweetness, but the feel of you is so faint. It's so in the background. I mean, it's kind of everywhere, but it's so faint that it's very difficult to get. It's very difficult to get the experience of it. But what seems to happen, and it's, we even have psychologists who suspect this is the case, what seems to happen is that when you move your attention directly to you, the feel of you, not self or anything like that, just you, what you call me. When you move your attention, trying to get a taste of that tiny sensation, for the fir- in the first place, you can't fail. You can think that you have failed, because it's so small a thing. But you can't fail. I mean, it's you. It's not something outside you. It's you. And what seems to be the case is that when attention is brought to that particular sensation. It invalidates the whole concept, the whole uh, wrecking crew that has been born in the conviction that there's something wrong. Something has to be done about something. And the best we can say is that the actual experience of you invalidates that. Just completely invalidates the whole thing. The context of fearfulness goes. It just goes. Usually what occurs after that, usually it it goes in a process like this. There's a short period of time when if you, whether you have consciously known that you've accomplished it or not, when you find yourself doing it again. And doing it again. And you'll find yourself doing it, you know, when you're driving in the car, or making breakfast, or whatever you're doing. People just start doing it because it feels good, because it's pleasant. That goes on for a little while. You know, for some it's uh, a month or so, for some it's a little bit longer than that. But that goes on for a little while where everything seems, oh yeah, we're all good here now. No, no problems, nothing to worry about. 
everything's going to turn out right. And then what happens, and I, I tell you this because I do, you know, it's only right that I should. Not that it's going to stop it from happening. <laughs> <laughs> then there come a time, and for most that time comes usually maybe two months in, somewhere around that period. So it's a little bit earlier, for some it's a little bit later, but suddenly everything goes upside down. And everything is worse than it has ever been before in life. It is terrible. It's, nothing works. Nothing is worth it. Everything is it's just terrible. And we've come to see that to be a period of recovery. We've come to believe that that this looking at yourself, or the, the disease of fear, is kind of a psychological autoimmune disease. Something has sparked fear in the infant mind, and, uh, and as a result, the mind gets busy trying to create uh, algorithms and relationships and so forth that take into account that you're in trouble here that have as their basic assumption that there's something wrong here, and they're here to fix it. When the disease goes, when the context goes, everything goes along for a while, but then those algorithms, they don't, there's no magic to this. Those algorithms born in fear suddenly wake up to the fact that they are disappearing and they fight back. You know, there's no, again, there's no agency to them. The only person that has, the only thing that has agency is you. That's it. And the only thing you have agency over is your attention. You must see that too. That's all you have, that's all you can do. Everything else is already here. Whenever you, by the time you see it, it's already here. You can't stop that from happening. But you can decide for yourself where to put your attention. Although it's hard in the beginning. It takes practice and work in the beginning. But that's what you can do. So during the period of recovery, and my period of recovery lasted about six years, and was not very pretty at all, uh, <laughs> by any stretch of the imagination. But now we're, we, we, have, we have like hundreds of people in an online forum that are going through recovery and helping one another with it. And uh, it's a really it's quite amazing to see. We've found that since it's true that the only thing you have anything to say about is your attention, that the best thing you can do during the period of recovery is to work with your attention and get good at it. Get good at determining for yourself what you attend to, what you put your attention on. And we have little exercises that help you in doing that. And the mind as the uh, as it, as the as the old soldiers of fear begin to actually disappear, the mind, your mind, reveals itself to be. Well, it's your life. That's where you see your life. That's where you experience your life, and your life turns out to be. Not. Like. Free of any difficulties. Life is full of difficulties. Not free of any pain. Life is full of pain. Not free of any pleasure either. Life is full of pleasure and satisfaction. But what happens is that you come to the point where you are self-reliant, where you determine for yourself what needs your attention and what doesn't need your attention. And you 
sink back into your life and find it everything you've ever wanted. Not like you have everything you ever want, but your life is everything you ever wanted, including the things that you want and don't have, including the things that you have and don't want. And what seems to happen over time is a kind of natural intelligence takes over. And from my own experience, and Karna's experience, and really, truly, the experience of several thousand people now. Life is worth living. Life is, life as a human being is magnificent. So I think I've gone well over my time. I have a tendency to do that, but I'd be happy to, uh, uh, you know, take questions and we can talk a little bit. There's a microphone there. So anybody want to talk to me? <coughs> This has nothing to do with knowing who I am. Okay. I have no idea who I am. Uh-huh. Really, I have no... Well, then before you became satisfied with yourself, is that a better way to say it? In my life, yeah. Um, like, whatever the transition was, before, there was a before and then an after. Um, it was a long before. A long before. Mm-hmm. And hopefully a long after, I imagine. <laughs> so far, so good. <laughs> Um, can you think that, can you say that thoughts led to the discovery of, the, the trans, led to the, to the uh, transition? And a type of thought such as uh, a thought of surrender, I mean, is surrender, no. the thought of surrender, no, the thought of thought, uh, thought like uh, letting go or the thought of opening, it wasn't anything like that. It was no. It was anger. It was anger at had been being hoodwinked by the spiritual agenda, and it was anger that, and not by Ramana. I never felt bad about Ramana, but it was anger at being hoodwinked by the spiritual agenda, and a determination to rid myself of any <clears throat> belief in spiritual uh, practice. That's what it was. I wanted to prove Ram and I'm wrong. It seems like it was an emotional reaction. I was miserable. Mm-hmm. I was miserable. I had it all. I had dead baby birds teaching me things. <laughs> I had it all. And then it was gone. And I was angry. And I was disappointed. And I was determined not to be taken in again. That's what my motive was. It wasn't to get anything good. It was to get rid of the idea that there was anything good to be gotten. You know, it's really easy that we, the, and, and I'm, I don't know if anybody else wants to talk, but I'd be happy to talk to you, but it would be much easier for you to just do the looking. It can't hurt you. And then you can see later for yourself whether what I'm talking about is good or bad or indifferent. So, just, just those of you who want to, let's stop for a second. And, and see if we can perform this act of looking, which is what I'm talking about. That's where the rubber meets the road. And it won't meet the road tonight, but it will meet the road eventually. So, let's just sit, you know, any way you want to. You know, you could stand on your head and do this. It <laughs> has no particular posture required. All right.
And what I want you to do is I want you to just sit quietly for a moment and get kind of settled in, in what, where you are mentally. Just kind of settled. Relaxed, at ease. And I want you to notice that you can move your attention. This is an important part of it. I want you to notice that you can move your attention. So I want you to move your attention, deliberately move your attention, oh, to the feel of your hands on your lap or any physical thing. Just move your attention to something physical that's easy and present with you. And then I want you to kind of look around within, the, within your mind. Kind of look around within your mind, trying to find an extremely faint sensation that you can recognize to be what it feels like to be you. And it's important that what I'm talking about here is what you would call me. Just you. The feel of you is very, very faint. Its chief characteristic is that it is always here. It's also quite sweet. You are. Now, if you have succeeded, and I can't imagine how you could not succeed, I can imagine you not believing you have succeeded. But I can't imagine you not succeeding. I mean, it's after all, it's just you. Nothing special. Just you. And if you have succeeded, I'm going to tell you what to expect so that you'll know that that's what's happening. If you have succeeded, the, the chances are that over the next day or two, or three, or four, that you'll feel lighthearted. You'll feel, you know, lighthearted. That's the only way I can say it. And also, you will find yourself doing that again. Not necessarily, in fact, probably not at all, because of any plan on your part. But you will just find yourself naturally being drawn, even if you thought you didn't get it, being drawn to that that again. 
and you'll feel pretty good. It's okay if you keep doing it. It's okay if you never do it again. But pretty much everybody who has done it reports that in the next, in the following days and weeks, that they find themselves doing it. I tell them you only have to do it once, and I think that's true. But once you've done it once, you keep going back to it. And if, if you have that experience over the coming days, then I would really advise that you consider the fact that everything I've been saying is true, including the part about it going to hell in weeks or months, including that part. Because I don't want you to be taken by surprise. <clears throat> this is just recovery from a disease. And if all of that happens, then what I think would be the very best thing you could do is to join our forums. They're free, no, no obligations or anything. They're just a free place where people who are in the throes of recovery from this talk to each other, share their experiences. The ones who are further along through recovery are helping those who are just arriving. It is, it is, I've never seen anything like this before. And because uh, the people actually want to help one another. And uh, the level of conversation in these forums is amazing. It, it's like nothing I've ever seen. So, <clears throat> that's all I have to say. Unless somebody else wants to talk to me. Can you come? <coughs> you know, I know it's a pain in the pain in the back. No, uh, right. But I was just wondering if there are any other words you can use to describe the experience that you just asked us to describe. The only the, really, the only word that really describes it is me. You're making contact with yourself. Right, but not as yourself, as me. As me. As You're me. My unique consciousness? No. Okay. Just me. Just me. The fact that you are here. Not your consciousness. Your consciousness is, is, is the, the content of your brain. That's where your consciousness appears, within your brain. I mean, not your brain, I'm sorry, your mind. That's where your consciousness appears. Right. You also are an experience within your mind, right? right? But it is the faintest experience of your mind, and it also has the, the characteristic of always being exactly the same. It doesn't move. That it doesn't personality change. that you were saying. Right. No, this is what was left. Right. The personality is moving all the time. Right. But you aren't. <coughs> you and, aren't. And that you, other than me? Yeah. Any other word no, I, I could relate me. to? Me is the best word. Me comes to a lot of... Uh, mm -hmm. The unique self that I am is self. Is yeah. No, that won't work. No. <laughs> that won't work. Just me. No, just me. <laughs> It's a little more, more primary more, and closer, right? Yeah, the more modifiers you put on it, the further away you get from it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's a very, it's a, it is a, it's not easy to see in the first place because you are a very faint. The experience of the sense you, of self, what the sense of me, as you, right. is very faint. Right. It's always there, it's always the same, but it's very faint. Mm -hmm. The mind. And you're saying that's to protect us? No, see, what it, what it is, is that when we, and, and pretty much every human being, there's, there are small, I'm sure there's small uh, things, you know, a small number of people that may not have been afflicted with this. Mm -hmm. And every once in a while you will see something that 
makes you think that to be the case. And sometimes it's true, most of the time it's not. <clears throat> most of us, when we are born, are afflicted with a sense that there's something wrong. Now that's not verbal, right? Mm -hmm. That's just a feeling that there's something wrong. Mm -hmm. Almost all of us are born like that. So that feeling that there's something wrong is the ground in which the mind grows. So it grows in soil that is contaminated with the idea that there's something wrong here. And the psychological mechanisms that it produces are, are tainted by that idea that their purpose here is to protect you from all kinds of true and not true things that are going to go wrong. So that the entire mind is populated with a bunch of algorithms that are, are created with the idea of keeping you from keeping you safe from your own life. Now, when you do the looking, this is what happens. The context, and see that context stays. The context is, there's something wrong here. But that's not silent, it's silent. Silent context is there's something wrong here. And, and mental mechanisms come and go, but the context stays. So that when, as new circumstances arise, which call for new psychological uh, relationships to them, the context is, if they appear within this context, that is the assumption that something's wrong, so that whatever you're going to do, you have to take that into consideration. When the context is gone, and the context is gone, I guarantee you, in the first moment that you touch with your attention, the actual feeling of you. That's where, that's where the looking at yourself comes in. That movement of attention there invalidates that context. The context goes, once and for all. And, uh, but there has to be a context, right? So a new context comes into being that's not afflicted with that stupidity. And new psychological mechanisms begin to form within a context that doesn't hold that there's something wrong here. Still, the old ones are there. They fall away over time. So they don't go all at once. There's not a, you know, a magical mystery movement. Those old ones are still there. And they are not only still there, but they're kind of falling off the edge of the world. And they see that. Or they, I'm, I'm using words as if they had agency and they don't. They're just mm -hmm. machines. But they see that as more proof that there's something wrong here that we've got to do something about which accounts for the increase of uh, misery and so forth during the recovery from this, because all these soldiers of fear, they're falling off the edge of the world. And they, and they think that you're going to be killed because of that. They're, they're failing in their job. So they get more energetic. Again, there's no agency there, but it's just the way the algorithm works. And we all know about algorithms and Sometimes they work and sometimes they don't. As that falls away, a new, a whole new outlook on life begins to reveal itself. You begin to be able to see it as the, as the, the soldiers of fear begin to fall away. They occlude your vision, your inner vision. And as they begin to fall away, you begin to see that, wow, there's really not anything wrong here. There are things, you know, that there are problems and there are opportunities and there's all the things that life brings, but there's nothing fundamentally wrong here. And what occurs in that, in my experience, is that you begin to really love your life. Not love your life like, you know, neurotically, but you really begin to see that life as a human being is special. Mm. And, and it has the, we have the capability, because we are human beings, we have the capability to relate to life in a way that is 
deeply satisfied. And like I said when I said, I'm really good at doing the dishes, I find great satisfaction in doing the dishes and doing them better, learning better ways to do them and more efficient ways and so forth and so on. And that's my whole life's like that. Is the whole life now is an opportunity to engage. Engage consciously, intelligently, and fearlessly with what is arising within the life as it presents itself in the, in the mind. And that, that, so far as I can tell, that development of, of um, love of life continues, well, it's continued for me now for, what, many years, 16, 18, 20 years. It's continued for me now for that long, at least after the six years. I, I spent six years in recovery mm -hmm. <laughs> because I didn't know what was going on. You know, there was nobody there to say, oh, what's happening is mm -hmm. what I'm telling you is happening. Carla, too. Long recovery. But now you don't have to put up with all that. So, what you're saying is, is sounds so simple. I mean, I'm one of those people that, at this point, I'm like, every thought, I'm like, watching every thought. And yes. The thought comes in... I will not give myself up. I am not that, you know, this practice. But what yeah. you're saying is I really don't need to that do that. That is going to fall. It feeds that it. Oh, that's see. good. The, where <laughs> the energy comes from. Now listen to this. This is important. All the energy comes oh. from your attention. Oh. That's all it comes from. Where you attend to it, it energizes oh, it. Oh, that's good. And that's why it is so effective at pulling your attention there. Mm -hmm. This is why... The, the practice of focused attention, which we greatly, it's something like mindfulness, but we don't, it's not mindfulness, it's something like that, mm -hmm. right? But the practice of focused attention allows you to decline to give them food, mm -hmm. allows you to determine for yourself mm -hmm. what deserves your attention in this moment. Mm -hmm. Does this, does this, oh my God, what, what about that thought? Is this, do I, is that to deserve my attention? No. That doesn't deserve my attention. And the less you attend to them, the weaker they get. Because that's their only source of, source of energy. That's it, your attention. And, and the disease is so terrible because one of its greatest symptoms is to capture your attention all the time. You're all the time. Bright, shiny things, ugly things, it always wants to have your attention. And the idea, really, the idea even that you have control over your attention can come as a shock to most of us. It really can. You know, it's like, what, what? But you can. And I tell you, there's, once you, it's, it isn't going to do you much good, but I think you did the looking. And once you've done the looking, working, to gain agency and intelligence about where you put your attention is the whole game. Really, it's the whole game. Right, so the looking, I mean, I meditate, you know, I consciously do yeah. that, but what you're saying is you, you don't really need to set a time to do that. You just try and kind of have your focus on the me like when you're washing the dishes? And we're, we're, we're got, no, we got, we got a couple things. Mm -hmm. There's two things here. Mm -hmm. One is the cure for the disease, and that's the looking. Mm -hmm. And when you do the looking, you're cured of the disease. You may, take, you may have six years of misery as you recover from the disease, but it will, it'll come out all right in the end. It came out fine for me in the end. The disease is cured when you look. That's it. It's the end of the story. What follows is you in your own life. And the greatest tool that you have in navigating your own life, once you're free of the fear, once you're free of that disease, the greatest tool you have is to have agency over your own attention. Mm -hmm. Because that's what, that's what you use to determine what you actually should do next as you see the circumstances that are 
revealed to you within your mind, that's how you decide what you should do next. Because you, 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 because you have control over your own attention. You're not, it's not being hijacked by uh, mm -hmm. craziness and mm -hmm. all of that. Mm -hmm. So the whole game, once the fear is gone, once the disease is cured, mm -hmm. the whole game from then on for the rest of your life is attention. Is paying attention to what's actually present. Paying attention to what's available to you. Paying attention to how to implement it. And putting your attention there. Sounds like living life. <laughs> yeah, right. Living in the it world. is. Good life. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Could you define the term agency as you're using it? Agency means that, that, that you are the one who has the power to decide what's being done. Okay. In that's agency. You're in control yourself. Yeah, you have control over okay. your attention. Okay. We're, we're, all right, we're almost out of time. We are out of time, but yeah. one more. All right. Well, I just wanted to ask about the invoking itself. Like, you're saying there's such a subtle, or would you say slight, or very small... It's faint, faint. faint. Yeah, faint sensation. Uh, so I'm just wondering, like... Um, you know, if it was, I mean, I think maybe I felt something like that, but uh, it's it it's like I feel uh, my 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 mind is sort of confused a little bit because my normal way of thinking about my I have a normal way and then an advice way, you know. My, uh, <laughs> my, my normal way is like it's not faint; it doesn't feel faint. Like I feel like I'm here. You know what I mean? I feel all these physical sensations, and I feel like I'm really here, and sometimes I wish I wasn't really here, but sometimes I'm like, all right, I am really here, or whatever. I feel like I, I, it doesn't feel faint. And then the, there's the advice of things, like, okay, just be the witness, and there's no sensation <laughs> at all, and what I am is, is what sees sensation. You know what I mean? So, so what you're saying seems, sounds like something in between or something. It's something <laughs> outside of both of those, actually. Uh, all right. You know, I, I, I have a regard for Advaita. I know I have some years in Advaita practice and, and understanding. But it has nothing to do with what you think is you when you say, oh yeah, I'm here and everything. The only reason you think that's you is because you haven't looked for you. That's your mind. What you're describing to be you is your mind. The experiences, the feelings, the the, the challenges, the, the happiness, the lack of happiness, the desire to do uh, Advaita practice, all of that is your mind. It's your personality. It is natural for you to mistake yourself for your personality. That's why we call it personality. Person. It's your person. But actually, it's not your person. It's just your personality. Your person is extremely faint, always present, always present, but extremely faint. Cares not what you do. Cares not what happens to the mind. Has no, no agency to care anything. It's just you existing here the, at the most distilled essence of you. But you, not something else, not... Not spirit, not not spirit, just you. It's probably a biological sensation, I suspect, because there really isn't much here but biology and psychology. So it's probably a kind of biological thing. 